How were the college football playoff semifinals won? Let's bring in the experts to tell us. You are locked on Big Ten. Your daily podcast on the Big Ten Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, thanks as always for tuning in to Locked On Big Ten. I'm your host, Nate Dickinson, and we've got a lot to get to today, so I'm going to be real quick with the intro here. Today, we're going to talk to three hosts from around the Locked On College Network to get their thoughts on the college football playoff semifinal games. We'll have Jay Stevens in from Locked On Buckeyes, Clint Shamblin in from Locked On Bulldogs with Georgia, and also Stephen Simcox in from Locked On TCU. Those are the three segments here today, three conversations with three of our local experts from three of the teams in the semifinals. It's going to be a jam-packed show with all sorts of expert analysis here on Locked On Big 10. Let's dive right into it. We're going to start here in the Big 10 and stay with someone you already know, Jay Stevens here from Locked On Buckeyes. You're tuned into Locked On Big 10, fresh off of an Ohio State basketball win. Jay Stevens is in with us. We'll talk basketball at some point with Jay here too, but right now still a whole lot of football to talk about. Jay, big game of course on Saturday, 42 to 41, the final score in favor of Georgia. Let's start with the big number that people are talking about from the start of the fourth quarter. Ohio State had a two-touchdown lead, and then it all went away. What was so different in that last 10-plus minutes compared to what had been looking like a pretty solid Ohio State game in terms of doing what they wanted to on offense? A couple things, Nate. One, the injury to Marvin Harrison Jr. was a big one. That was a huge loss. It reminds us of... Uh, how last year in the national championship game, Jamison Williams goes down for Alabama. Georgia ends up winning that game and winning their first national championship in, I believe, 40 years. And so that injury alone was a big one, but also a reminder of what happened in the Michigan game. The defense gives up big plays. Big, the defense gets gashed. And the next thing you know, the Buckeyes are wondering, what is going on? How do we overcome this issue here? Big plays on defense, giving those up, have been an issue for the Buckeyes. And I firmly think, even with those plays, if Harrison Jr. is in the game, if he's healthy and if he does not get that major, major rough hit, hard hit in the back of the end zone, the Buckeyes win the game. Like, they've been winning despite the issues on defense all year long. Yes, Jim Knowles came in and changed things on defense, and the statistics look a whole lot better than they did a year ago. However, the rankings and numbers only mean so much. In these big games, the Buckeyes give up big plays consistently, and that was a big reason why. Stetson Bennett, who had been just okay, not over the top throughout the game, made big plays down the stretch for Georgia to win the game. I mean, if the game was 30 seconds longer, Ohio State could have easily won that game just uh, compared to what ended up happening. With, I mean, you mentioned Marvin Harrison Jr., everything like that, a whole bunch of ways. Ohio State ends up winning this game. It just doesn't end up that way for them this time around. Uh, what do you feel like Ohio State fans are feeling right now as far as just how to take the season as a whole? Better than they did a month ago, Nate, just to be honest with you. There is more confidence in Ryan Day. Seeing Ryan Day being as animated as he was on the sideline. I don't remember a game he has ever been that animated. There's a belief, there should be a belief in Ryan Day after that game, more of a belief than fans already had. So there's a there's a sense of optimism. I've already seen tweets of people saying Ohio State's offense or defense, the guys returning, they are going to be loaded. And honestly, they will be loaded, but they feel a whole lot better, even after a loss, than they would have than they did a month ago. Now I will tell you. This loss stings because Ohio State was right there to win the game. They were right there. You mentioned a 10-minute stretch. Even after that, you have a field goal, which I believe Noah Ruggles normally makes. I don't know for sure if that hold was secure, if it was laces in, laces out. I don't know. I don't know if it was the ball was hop, was was wobbling. I have I I don't know. But something tells me something was there with the hold, which is why the ball was kicked. So oddly, it looks so weird coming out. But Ohio State fans should be happy 
that they are the Ohio State. Ohio State is in the situation that they are in. And honestly, the quarterback, the quarterback situation might be the biggest concern they have. Because outside of that, I could look at every position to talk about this player coming back, that player coming back, and give Buckeye fans a good reason why they should be excited about what's going to happen next year. But this one seems, Nate, just like that loss to Clemson did in 2019. Let's talk about that quarterback for a minute, Jay. What is C.J. Stroud's legacy with the Buckeyes? Interesting question, because I talked to my dad about this earlier, and I'm actually going to record a show with the guy um, coming up on Tuesday show for Locked on Buckeyes, and uh, I was pleased with Stroud's play yesterday. But I think the legacy overall is he is an amazing quarterback, amazing talent, never won his division, which also ultimately means you never won the conference. You never beat Michigan. And I think that even though he doesn't have a win in the playoffs, I think that not beating Michigan and not winning the Big Ten, Big Ten Conference, I think those two things are going, to be, are going to be over him greatly when the conversation is, who is he as an Ohio State quarterback? Well, you didn't win the conference, no ring there, no gold pants that you, that, that you won because in – because I want to say his freshman year, they didn't even play. Um, 2020, they didn't even play Michigan, so he didn't have a chance to win the gold pants and to play Michigan in that year. And so, great quarterback. I mean, I'm a great quarterback, one of the best quarterbacks to ever be at Ohio State. But if you don't beat your rival, if you don't win conference, as great as you are, as good as the numbers are, and as great as the passes are that you make, people will hold you and say, you didn't win the big one. Big one being Michigan. You did not do that. And ultimately, I think that's going to be a big talking point when it, t- when it comes to the legacy conversation of C.J. Stroud. Yeah, I think it's going to be any other situation. He gets remembered for what he is, a two-time Heisman finalist. But instead, just because it's the Ohio State quarterbacks that he has to be compared against and the fact that he wasn't able to win those games against Michigan, it, it feels like that's going to be more what people are talking about, even if that's not fair for him. But anyway, Jay Stevens here with Locked On Buckeyes. He mentioned he's going to be talking about it on Locked On Buckeyes the entire time on the show. Jay, before we let you go, uh, we talked about the quarterback. Let's talk about the head coach again. You already touched on Ryan Day and how people should have faith in him. But now one and two against the Wolverines still has not won the, of course, college football playoff game as he won or lost over the weekend. Uh, where are things at with him right now? Because I'm with you and I'm with you on CJ Stroud too. He played outstanding on Saturday. I think Ryan Day did pretty well as far as just coaching the game. And like you said, so showed some emotion that I thought was obvious to see right off the bat that you'd really like. But uh, where are things at with what the fans think about him? With Ryan Day, I do believe fans have a belief in Ryan Day because what we just witnessed, even though it's a loss, Ryan Day showed that over a month span for the second time as a coach at Ohio State, he can drop a game plan. He can get the team ready to go. He can get the coaches loose and ready to co- ready to coach the game. 2019, 20, excuse me, 2020. Actually, 2019, the Buckeyes had some good stuff going there. But 2019, 2020, 2022, in the playoff, Ryan Day can do some phenomenal things with that month off. Phenomenal, great things. And so I do think the Buckeyes – there's a little bit more optimism with Ryan Day. There's a little bit more belief in Ryan Day, even after a loss, which I was not expecting to say. Nate, I will tell you this. I did not expect Ohio State to win the game. I did not. But knowing how the game went, knowing how Ryan Day called it, knowing how Ryan Day got a little bit more animated, a little bit more juice in him, I feel a better belief in Ryan Day than I did prior to that. Keep this in mind, though. If he does not beat Michigan next year and goes th- loses three in a row, there is going to be a great conversation that he is not the man in, in Columbus. Now, let's just say for some reason next year, they lose to Michigan. They ultimately still find a way to make the playoff and win the national championship. Then there's a conversation. Is Ohio State comfortable losing to Michigan and still winning the national championship? That's a conversation people need to have. But right now, there's a belief in Ryan Day. Well, a bit more of a belief in Ryan Day. But ultimately... In a couple weeks, or maybe over the summer, this conversation of 
Will he beat Michigan in Thanksgiving weekend of now 2023 this year? That's going to be something we're going to be having for quite a long time because I don't care about the playoff appearances. And ultimately, I don't care about even uh, uh, going only having one loss of the season. If you have, if that one loss comes to comes to Michigan, that's a conversation. I do want Ohio State to go undefeated. I believe they can go undefeated next season. But if you lose to Michigan Thanksgiving weekend, Nate, I don't care about everything else. Three years in a row, there's a conversation that maybe he is not the guy to lead Ohio State consistently in Columbus. Yeah, oh, I think a big part of the reason that confidence might be there at least right now is because Ohio State proved that it belonged to be in that game on Saturday. It was facing off against a Georgia team that we've talked about, in my opinion, is the best in the country. And in the last two kind of real tests of that ability to be the best of the best, Ohio State's got kind of beaten up by Michigan. So for them to come back again, like you said, a month later and really prove that they did belong there, I think that instills the confidence for now, but eventually it does all go back to wins and losses. And a few months from now, I think people could definitely forget about how good Ohio State looked and just see the L's in the columns there. So we'll see what ends up happening, whatever it is. I know you'll be over there and on top of it on Locked On. But guys, they're all every single weekday, every single weekday like we are here at Locked On Big Ten. Thanks again, Dave, for Jay, for talking a little bit with us here uh, at the end of your weekend. Of course, Nate, no problem. I really enjoyed it. Once again, thanks to Jay Stevens for joining us here on Locked On Big Ten to talk a little bit on the Ohio State and Georgia matchup that we had over the weekend. We'll, of course, talk with Clint Shamblin of Locked On Bulldogs on the same matchup from the Georgia side in just a second. And also we'll have Locked On TCU's Stephen Simcox in to wrap things up on the show as well. Before we do any of that, If you're a business that has made it into 2023, then you know that part of the reason is because you have a great team of people around you. And if you have an open position going into the new year, you may be uncertain on how exactly to make sure you keep that high quality of team. Well, if you're looking to find the perfect candidate for your open job, you can do it at LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn is a reputation on its own. I don't have to pump up LinkedIn. If you are a professional and you are online, you probably already have a LinkedIn account. So head on over to linkedin.com slash locked on college to see what I'm talking about. LinkedIn jobs, the opportunity to find the perfect candidate for your job for free with the help of us and LinkedIn. If you head on over to linkedin.com slash locked on college, you can find the person for your job for free free. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Let's dive right back in with the two teams not from the Big Ten, the two teams that won the college football playoff semifinal games over the weekend. We'll talk to Clint Chamblin from Locked On Bulldogs right now. After that, Stephen Simcox in from Locked On TCU. You're tuned into Locked On Big Ten, everything you need to know about the Big Ten Conference every day of the week, alongside one of the hosts of the Locked On Bulldogs podcast covering Georgia. Clint Chamblin's here with us. I'm Nate Dickinson. We're here to break down, of course, Ohio State and Georgia. It was a huge battle throughout the night that ended up in a big Georgia comeback. I want to start there, Clint. As you were in that fourth quarter, down by 14 points, what were you thinking about the prospects going into the comeback? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Any dog fan that says that we were not nervous and not stressed out, lying their tails off. Everybody was stressed and nervous. Uh, Having already come back by 14 one time in the game, now in the fourth, and, and this resiliency that we've been talking about, this physicality, this Stetson Bennett fourth quarter, I, I don't think anybody in the world thought this was going to happen the way that it did, especially since we already had taken the best shot from Ohio State and climbed back in. So when it was 14, and especially when we kicked that field goal, we were down near the back and Stets throws it behind, and we had to get that fumble, and we were out of uh, striking range for the touchdown. Uh, everyone thought it was over. And then... Uh, Kirby Smart, Todd Munkin, and Stetson Bennett solidified themselves as goats of all time at UGA. So it was stressful and chaotic all the way up until uh, that final last minute. Well, you mentioned you took Ohio State's best shot. What was it that you think allowed the Buckeyes to be so successful early on? Because they beat up on that Georgia defense in a way that we hadn't seen anybody do in a really long time. 
No, absolutely. The, the two sides of this, and we talked about this a little bit on the podcast. I think Kirby Smart, the genius of Kirby Smart, sometimes he gets too much time to, to sit and think and things go bad. We saw this against LSU a number of years ago in the SEC championship game. Uh, we saw this since Alabama SEC championship game. Um, adjustments weren't made at halftime this year. And I think it just comes down to three things. One, CJ Stroud is the best quarterback. Look, Alabama fans, Bryce Young, keep it. CJ Stroud is the best quarterback. That athleticism to get outside the pocket, the accuracy. I was amazed at his accuracy. So one, CJ Stroud, incredible. Two, uh, pressure up front. And, and I'm not even gonna talk about Pac-12 res- referees. It's pointless. Ohio State did a great job moving around the elusiveness of C.J. Stroud and not getting pressure. Jalen Carter was um, uh, mitigated, all intents and purposes. Our outside linebacker's edge couldn't get up the field. We had four sacks we missed tackles on. That was key. We get those four sacks, different ball game. We couldn't tackle. I don't know what was going on there. And in the back end, um, you could take stats and throw them out the window. Kamari Lasseter and Keely Ringo were scorched earth against these wide receivers, just scorched earth. Now we did step up when needed to later on in the game. Um, Bullard played very well. Christopher Smith played well. Uh, it was it was the back half that couldn't keep up after five seconds because our rush wasn't getting there. So those three things combined were the perfect recipe. It was like this Northeastern storm of cold and wet front making a hellacious time in the Northeast. Uh, that's what CJ Stroud, back end falling off because pressure couldn't get there after five seconds. Uh, and we saw it on Saturday. Well, we put most of the credit for that comeback at the end for, or I guess more than 14 points when you end up winning the game the last, what was 10 plus minutes in that fourth quarter. Yes. Uh, there's, there's two things. Um, one, we heard Ohio state say, Hey, we had to practice physicality for this whole entire week. And we got on and said, look, you don't practice physicality for a couple of weeks. You practice physicality all year long. We had our C game, C plus, B minus game. Ohio State had their A game. And this really comes down to a, a culture of winning, a, a system of winning that is implemented years ago. Um, this is not uh, implementation or a new scheme that happens month in, month out, or week in, week out. That's not what this is. This was given during spring ball, during summer ball, two years ago. This is... Christopher Smith coming back to try to up his draft potential. Uh, This is Keely Ringo and recruiting and development all the way through. Because if you look at even the injuries, we were without A.D. Mitchell for almost the entire season. He comes back and plays very well. Lad McConkey injured. Uh, Darnell Washington, who, look, our offense goes through him, blocking and receiving. I, I know he doesn't get all the stats, but it goes through him. The guys say so as well. He goes down, and it is. He said so after the game next man up mentality. So really, I think what has happened is the standard at Georgia has become, we can go ahead and play a down game and it's still better or on par with the best shot of others. Um, And that is Kirby Smart and his coaching staff for now years implementing a system uh, that is not just dependent on transfer portal or talent infusion, uh, it's development through and through for now, like I said, six, seven years. Clint here with us. Uh, Clint, what do you say to the Ohio State fans who are making noise about that not targeting call that we had in the game? Javon Bullard, Marvin Harrison Jr., obviously in the middle of the momentum shift. Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, uh, I hated for that kid that he went out of the game. I, 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 that was awful. So hated for him. Secondly, um, it, it, it's not targeting. It's a shoulder. It wasn't head to head. Um, and this is where the, the, the going back to Pac-12 referees look, guys, like, let's just keep it. There were so many missed calls everywhere. It was a, it was a sloppy, sloppy game. So uh, was it violent? Yeah, it was very violent. Has the game maybe changed where those violent things look and appear something different? It probably does. Uh, if you look at the tape, uh, Bullard's moving his head back uh, and he hits with that right shoulder. It was violent upon violent, 100% a good football play. It wasn't dirty at all. As a matter of fact, Georgia hasn't had a targeting penalty uh, all year. Coach Smart makes it a very, very big key point because he loves safety. And so he's coaching those DBs and they must, uh, our our DBs must remain physical. uh, And he infuses that into them. And so those hits, uh, I can guarantee you, Kirby Smart, it's not dirty. Uh, It was with a shoulder. It was very violent. 
Um, and it, so I can understand Ohio State fan having some sympathy for it, but uh, in no way was that a penalty. Well, unfortunately, it's not a Big Ten question that I'm asking now, Clint, but as you get ready for the national championship game, how are you feeling with TCU headed your way? You know, what was uh, phenomenal to me is, is I saw somewhere, I, I can't give credit because I forget who it was, but uh, somebody said TCU is like a cockroach. You just can't kill them. Uh, and, and that is indicative to what it is we saw against Michigan and Ohio State. The thing that made Michigan get into the playoff and then later Ohio State, thankfully, because USC fumbled the bag, uh, was these explosive plays. That's what helped Michigan all the way throughout. We had Ohio State fan on our on our podcast and, and our Twitter feed telling us all the time, hey, look at the film, look at the tape. It's not as bad as you guys are making it. And admittedly, I thought 40 points was not in the picture at all for Ohio State. I was dead wrong. That's a good, good team. Uh, Michigan beat them by explosive plays, right? TCU, if you look at their stats, they're actually a very, very, uh, they're actually bad uh, efficient-wise. Uh, analytics, deep analytics, they're very, very bad on efficiency on offense and on defense. Uh, if you look back at the game against Michigan, four plays, two interceptions, a sack on fourth, and a fumble recovery made that game turn. And without those four, I think Michigan just walks all over TCU. And so really what it comes down to is, is I want to see Georgia play the most, most boring football in the entire world because that's what's going to win a national championship. If you don't allow TCU to have those big plays, have those explosive plays, um, just like Ohio State, if they didn't allow those big plays against Michigan, probably go ahead and make that a competitive game. So TCU, I want a very bland vanilla game. No turnovers, no sacks. And we should, I, I hate saying this coming off Ohio State, we should roll in that national championship game. But of course, it's football. And who the heck knows? Because that's why you play the game. Certainly seems like if they just play a straight up game like that, George is the better team and would come out on top, at least with what we're thinking right now. Bulldogs get the best of Ohio State just Barely, I said before, it was you could say they were a field goal short. You could say they were 30 seconds short. If that game's a little longer, you could say about a 10 or 15 different things that could have gone a different way and let Ohio State win it. Just didn't happen. Instead, Clint and the Bulldogs headed to the national championship game. Bulldogs, right there. Clint's going to be talking about it on Locked On Bulldogs every single weekday. Thanks for coming on to talk with us about it here on Locked On Big Ten for a couple of minutes, Clint. Absolutely. Thank you. Listening into Locked On Big Ten, everything you need to know about the conference every single weekday. Stephen Simcox is in from Locked On TCU. The Horned Frogs, of course, picked up the win over Michigan over the weekend in the semifinal. And now they're headed to the national championship. But we're, of course, going to talk to him a little bit here about what happened on Saturday night. Well, Stephen, as you're here with us now, it was a huge, huge game with a huge, huge amount of things that we could talk about. Both of them were. What did you take away as just some of the biggest things to highlight about why TCU won this game and just how things went down in general? Well, uh, I appreciate you having me on. I mean, it was uh, it was a crazy game. I said this yesterday. The second half was almost like its own entity. So it's it's kind of weird to even look back at the first half of that game and try to parse much out from it because it was such a crazy back and forth. Uh, finish but I really feel like you know things fell into place for TCU they forced those turnovers they get the pick six um, in, in that sequence at the beginning of the game you know Michigan pops off that big run in the first play uh, they get a little creative on fourth and goal and that play sort of blew up in their face and TCU didn't score off that possession but they punt and then they end up getting the interception for a touchdown I just feel like it was really significant that they jumped out to that lead, even though J.J. McCarthy ended up making some really good plays with his arm and his legs. Um, it it kind of took them out of what they love to do, which is, you know, run the football, um, stay on schedule, uh, play their their style of ball, and they were they were chasing TCU pretty much the whole game. But um, I was super impressed with their ability. I mean. Really, after that first series, like Donovan Edwards, he had a, a decent stat line, but I don't feel like he had the impact on the game that, that most people expected. Um, and offensively, I, you know, they just – they answered the bell. Like, every time it looked like, okay, Michigan's about to take this game over, uh, they, they cut it to three a couple times, cut it to five at one point, and TCU either had a big play for a touchdown or, or put together a drive to score a touchdown. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, they just kind of – took every punch and, and landed a, a counter punch and 
I, I feel like it's hard to tell. I mean, it, it's it's impossible to know these things. I think some of the comments the Michigan guys made during the week led me to believe that uh, maybe they thought they were just going to sort of waltz to a win and, and end up in the national title game. And I, I feel like they ended up in a dog fight and they weren't quite prepared for a, a 60 minute full football game and TCU took advantage of it. You mentioned TCU just got some of the breaks as far as the turnovers go and making the big plays. Uh, also a couple of breaks, Michigan fans would say as far as just what happened on the whistles, uh, Referees with Roman Wilson early in the game on a touchdown call that goes the other way. Of course, Michigan then turns the ball over. That's their fault. And then later on at the very end of the game, the no targeting call that everybody at the time was talking about, should it have been a targeting call or not? What do you say about both of those situations? Well, I was surprised the Roman Wilson play got overturned. I mean, I did see one. I saw like one still shot it was a photograph where it looked like maybe he, it looked like he had possession of the football and like he was sitting right outside the goal line. But on the video replay, I just didn't see any angle that made me think, Oh yeah, there's evidence to overturn that. So I get why Michigan fans are upset about that. Um, I think given the call in the field, it was, it was a blown call. And then, I mean, yeah, TCU catches another huge break with, with the bad exchange on the handoff. Um, the targeting situation, I don't know, Nate. I still have no idea what targeting is. I feel like it's just kind of a a made up thing every uh, every time they review it. But when I watched it live, I saw the hit and I I saw one of the Michigan linemen, you know, doing this, and I immediately thought, oh no, that that did look like like that did look like targeting. And then I thought they were going to get the snap off before they reviewed it, but they ended up reviewing the play. Um, I mean, I think TCU did benefit from a couple things. One being, it's it's really hard to just come out of the booth in that situation. I, I know it's the letter of the law, but I, I do think there was maybe some pressure from the officials. On, do we, do we want to come out here and call that? And, I mean, it would just really be completely bailing out Michigan on that play. Uh, and then I also had a question about, and I don't know if they talked about this within the review because I know they weren't reviewing that, but Donovan Edwards, like he basically threw a forward pass. And I know that was the, that was technically the the only pass on that possession, but I just, I, I didn't know the, the ins and outs of like, okay, it's a fumble. Can you advance it by tossing the ball forward? It was just a chaotic play. And I think at the end of it, they probably just said, let's just leave it, leave it as is. But I mean, I get what, yeah, I, I get why they they have beef. I think, um, you you look at it, Kean Stewart, he he led with his helmet. I mean, he was putting his head down. I I would not have been surprised if they called targeting, um, and that would have been an interesting thing to see how it played out because they would have had the ball. I mean, still a tall task, but you get the ball at the forty with twenty five seconds left, and that's not impossible, right? Like some things could happen there, um. And so I think TC really benefited in that situation from just sort of the 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 situation at hand to let the officials just say maybe we should just let this let this go. And you know, I mean, I get it. I get why folks are mad, but also I think Michigan had some miscues that led to that loss on on Saturday. Stephen Simcox here with us from Locked On TCU. Stephen. I mentioned before the game, this could either be a Big Ten football game, in which case I think Michigan has a really good chance of pulling away in it, or this could end up being a Big 12 kind of game, shootout kind of game. And while it wasn't the most conventional way to get to 50 points with the defensive touchdowns and things like that, it still was definitely without a doubt more of that run and gun shootout kind of style. What do you think were the biggest things that contributed to that? Well, I just feel like honestly, I mean, it was it was the fact that TCU had a, a fifteen point lead, kind of going into halftime. Um, but and, and so they forced Michigan to do some some things that were uncharacteristic. But yeah, that third quarter just got out of hand in a hurry. I mean, it was just play after play, uh, and and there were multiple opportunities. There were multiple points in that game. You know, when Z winners had the pick six, and I, I believe that put TCU up nineteen. Uh, that felt like kind of the dagger, but quickly Michigan got right back in it. T 
TCU turned the ball over and allowed them to score. I, I think it was just some short fields. And uh, I mean, I was impressed. Like I didn't, I didn't know that Michigan could get up and down the field like that so quickly the way they did it. I, kn- I mean, I knew they could run the ball, um, but Ronnie Bell kind of had his way, you know, in that game. I, I really felt like the TCU secondary would match up better with those Michigan wide receivers than they did. But ultimately I think uh, it was a pace and a style that TCU was comfortable with and they've been in a lot of close games. So, I mean, that's, that's part of it too. I can't really explain it, but they're just a team that like, if if there's a, a silly or weird way that a game's going to go, TCU's probably going to be involved in it because a lot of their games have come down to the wire this year and have just been really wacky and orthodox. So they, they sort of have a way of, of attracting that. All right, well, before we let you go, how, how do you feel about the last one, matchup against Georgia for the national championship? Yeah, I mean, Georgia's the Death Star, right? Like, they're so talented. Um, I do think Ohio State was able to get up and down the field uh, a little bit on them in the passing game. And TCU does have good wide receivers, so th- there's there could be uh, some advantages there if they can protect Max Duggan. Um, obviously, like the talent disparity, it's it's similar to the Michigan game. I think even on a higher level with the way Georgia recruits and the type of players they bring in. But, you know, I'm just kind of like – I'm sort of done doubting this team. I think they've, they've overcome just about every obstacle this year. I, I think it's going to be a competitive game. I think it'll be a good game. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But I, I do believe it's going to come down to the wire. I think that 13.5 point spread is too high. I, I sense that's probably going to come down some before the game starts. But Georgia's a really good team. And, um, you know, TCU has, has been able to stand up physically with everybody. And that was a big question going into the Michigan game. That'll be another big question against Georgia. Georgia has better athletes on the outside, I, I feel like, than Michigan does. And so – They'll have to, you know, find a way to, to slow down the passing game too. But uh, I, I think they got a shot. And, you know, I just feel like they're a team that's playing with a lot of confidence right now. So that makes a big difference. Steven Simcox here with Locked On at TCU. If you want to know about everything you need to know leading up to the national championship game, give a show a follow and he'll be sure to keep you filled in. It's going to be a good one here as we lead up to the last game of the season. I mean, These two teams proved, if nothing else, that they belong here in this championship game. And Ohio State and Michigan proved that they belonged in the semifinals, too. A couple of really, really good games, and hopefully we'll get a good one to wrap up the season as well. Stephen Simcox, of course, will have it all covered over on Locked on TCU. Thanks for coming on to talk to us for a couple of minutes here. Thanks, Nate. Thank you once again to Clint and Steven for joining us here on Locked On Big Ten, as well as another thank you to Jay Stevens at the top of the show for talking to us. We're going to be back tomorrow breaking down even more bowl games. We're going to have Caroline Fenton in from Locked On LSU to talk about the beatdown at the Purdue Boilermakers on the football field. And of course, there's basketball going on too. We're going to have to catch up on everything that's happening on the hardwood as well. That's all coming up right here on Locked On Big Ten. Until then, be sure to follow us wherever you're getting your podcasts on YouTube and on Twitter too. It's at Locked On Big Ten. One zero when you're typing it out at the end, not T-E-N. I'm Nate Dickinson at Nate with Sports. We'll be back tomorrow with more. Until then, Nate Dickinson with Locked On.